morning, everybody. So I am Cody Shamrock. I am the product specialist at Leonard Bus Sales. And my job is basically to dissect and understand new technology and break it down and bring it to a level that works for you. So I'm going to go through the presentation here and give you uh, detail on the system, how it works, some of the things you need to know, and then, of course, answer your questions along the way. So first and foremost, Technology is really great when it's used the right way. You think about cell phones and Twitter and Facebook and all that. There's good resources there, but the people that want to use it the wrong way will use it the wrong way, and it's, it's no good. So like anything, you've got to have a skilled, professional, alert driver that knows what they're doing and knows what they're doing well because this technology is not going to make a bad driver a good driver. It might fix a couple of bad habits that they have, but it's really not going to... Um, make them ultimately a better driver overall. If they have really lousy habits, they're going to continue to have lousy habits. It might train them a little bit, but it's not going to fix everything. So it's really there to assist trained professionals. Anybody that thinks that this is a replacement for a good driver is in the wrong right away. So we know that uh, just from you know, experience and trying it and, and teaching to it. So the push for this really is, is based on a lot of data. Nobody decided that this was something we wanted to throw out there just on a whim. There's data to back it. So NHTSA is always pushing for new technology, and it's because they have facts that state that it's worth having. So in 2017, for example, 37,000 plus people died in motor vehicle crashes. Most of them are tied to human error, which we're pretty well aware of when you go down the road, how many people do you see that are distracted or just driving in general and you see them do something that you know is just not right because they don't really know what they're doing. They're not well trained and there's no follow up for those people either. So in 2004, IAHS did a study and found that just having stability control alone can reduce single fatal accidents by 56%. That stat alone is, is pretty convincing in why we should have stability control. When you can prevent more than half of the fatal accidents just by adding a stability system, it seems kind of silly to not have that as an option. So then in 2016, 40% of car models had collision mitigation. So you know your standard Saturn, Toyota, Chevy, whatever, it had that. School buses didn't have anything. There was nothing on a school bus up until recently, as you know. In 2012, it became required on vehicles under 10,000 pounds. So cars were now required to have it. Now cars are required to have backup cameras and other technologies. In June of 2018, Canada actually required stability control. So now we've got Canadians are running it on all of their new school buses since June of 18. All of our passenger cars, for the most part, have it. And then in 2015, NHTSA said, basically everything has to have it except school bus. Everything needs to have it. So motor coach, over the road truck, all of those, those vehicles need to have stability control. School buses are exempt, which seems a little backwards. You'd think that with what we do, you'd want that technology there. Uh, but we weren't at a point where we could do that. So now we are. And it's worth noting that all of the three large bus manufacturers now offer it or have it as a standard feature. So that says something. Again, if all three are doing it, there's probably writing on the wall somewhere that says, you know, we need to have this technology. So let's, let's get ahead of it. So you think about your car that you drive and the technology that you've seen on it. Really think about it. You've got ABS, stability control, backup cameras, you know, lane departure, all these different technologies on your vehicles now. And maybe you don't own a vehicle with it, but you might drive a rental car or something. Maybe your, your friend's car has it, whoever. You're, you're used to seeing some of this stuff. Backup cameras are standard now. You put it in reverse and the camera pops up. So, We've seen technology added to our cars, and school buses really haven't seen much of anything. So maybe we have backup cameras. Some places do, some places don't. There's good arguments either way. Heated power mirrors, there's still a lot of places out there that don't have them. Power doors, most. We still have a couple people that do the old school manual door. You might have a pedlock. You might have, you know, you're going to have ABS. The point is, really, Think about what you've added to your bus. What are you really, what's really changed when you do your job day to day from a driver's perspective? You know, it might look a little nicer, a little nicer layout, more ergonomic, you know, but ultimately, what's different? Not much. Going forward, though, is when we, we have technology that makes the bus better than what it was before, and that's the stability control and collision mitigation that you guys are now running. So you know what ESC is, but I'll run through it. So there are sensors that monitor the vehicle's movement. So underneath the floor, in the kind of behind the white line, there's a box, and that's a lateral and yaw rate sensor. And what it's looking for is chassis movement forward, back, side to side. 
so on. And what it wants to do is make sure that what the driver is telling the bus it should do is what's actually happening. So in the steering wheel, or in the column, there's a steering angle sensor, you've got a brake pressure sensor, and then uh, you've got that lateral sensor underneath. And what's happening is if the wheel is on a straight forward trajectory, the driver's wheel is straight, you know, they have their foot on the brake, in theory the bus should be slowing in a straight line. What happens on icy roads, as we know, is the driver hits the brake and the back end begins to fishtail. Their reaction is to counter steer. What this is going to do often is prevent them from even being aware that the bus was fishtailing in the first place. So it may sense brake applied, zero degree angle on the steering, back end is not going where it should and what it's going to do is apply and release brakes at each wheel end if it needs to to keep that bus on a straight path. So the driver might not have any idea at all that the bus is doing something. Uh, you may see the flashing uh, traction control, stability control light. That's pretty common. You know, the car with the little skid behind it, that'll, that'll flicker like in a normal car. But generally, the driver's not even aware. And the idea is to make sure the bus goes where the driver wants it to. So if you were, if you guys went down to Tulsa, or you went to Tulsa, you said, right? They, uh, they may have mentioned the closed course testing that they've done. And I was involved with that. And they have a um, blacktop surface. They tar the whole thing so it's real slick when it's wet. And they, they took a driver and put him out there with people in the bus and said, we want you to make a left turn at 40 miles an hour. So we, uh, we hit the skid pad at 40. And with the system off or a bus without it, he ripped the wheel hard left, and the bus did nothing. Wheels were turned. Bus kept on a straight path. It was like the front end wasn't even connected to the, to the steering wheel. With it on, a different bus, same thing. He ripped his wheel to the left at 40, and immediately the brakes began to apply. It cut his throttle, and we made the turn without touching a single cone. Now, you're not going to make a turn at 40 miles an hour. Your driver will lose their job if they try. But if it can respond at 40, it can respond at 30, 20, 10, 5, whatever it is. So we know that it works, and I've had firsthand experience on the bus doing it. And it's, it's really quite scary and unnatural to be part of that, but it definitely kind of solidified my belief in the fact that it works. So the bus we have, the demo uh, that you guys, I think you, some of you may have seen it. We brought it here a while back now. And uh, that particular bus, I've tried to fishtail it in the winter intentionally. If you take a bus around a curve or a, t a corner and you floor it, you know you're going to be able to kick the back end out. I can't do it with that bus no matter how hard I try. You just can't make it fishtail because it's not going to let you. You know, it's sensing where the bus is intending to go versus where it's actually going and it's stopping the driver from doing that. So in a dry road situation, if they come around a curve too fast and their foot's on the throttle, it can actually cut the throttle completely out. So you may have some drivers that have experienced making a turn from a stop sign, let's say, and they accelerate and they go to turn the wheel and they feel the throttle cut out for a second. That's the stability control system saying your, your steering angle is X. This is too much power for that maneuver. It shouldn't be that much power. So you'll feel that actually cut out. And that's probably the most common interaction they're going to have with stability control until they get used to it, is when they're flooring it and they're cutting that wheel hard to the right and they're taking a turn maybe too quickly. Um, and some of that's, again, just habit, especially as you go from diesel to gas. The gas are a little more punchy. You know, they, they have to get used to different throttle types and, and how to drive because you don't have that turbo lag that you do with the diesel. Again, the driver is in control regardless. It doesn't steer for you. It can't steer for you. So you think about where you risk loss of control, and I won't go into great detail because you know, but it's basically everywhere is the nuts and bolts of it. Dry roads, icy, doesn't matter. Driver can lose control at any point in time. Fortunately, most of the time, we don't have that problem. You know, our, we, we make it back safe, and we can go for weeks, weeks, months, years without a problem. Every so often, something comes up. And what I often say is that the district that has the accident never expected the accident to happen that day. You know, nobody wakes up and says, this is the day. You know, you might have bad roads and think, you know, I hope everybody makes it back. But the reality is when that bus overturns or loses control, nobody was expecting that. Prevent loss of control, stay focused, anticipate hazards, just drive for the weather. That's, that's the common sense of it. You see people with four-wheel drive go down the left lane on the thruway when it's snowing, you can't see anything, and they're going 65, 70, 80 miles an hour because four-wheel drive is supposed to help. That's not anticipating hazards or understanding safe driving practices. That's thinking that there's a crutch there. So even with the system, my point is you can lose control. Same with four-wheel drive. If you have four-wheel drive on, doesn't mean you're never going to lose control of the vehicle. So if you actually Google school bus rollover, this is not intended to be a scare tactic, but the reality is that we don't think that it happens because we don't hear about it very often. 
but it does happen. And none of these were in New York State, fortunately, but I don't think that matters. Whether it's Pennsylvania, Minnesota, New York, they're kids. And you know, it's, it's some, something went wrong here. And uh, we do know that it can happen. It has happened. We've seen it you know, in recent years. Um, and it's just kind of, again, a quick Google search yields a lot more results than you might think. So we're not immune. And again, none of these people three minutes prior to this had any idea that that was going to be how their day ended. You know, it could be reading a route sheet, just having a conversation, doing what you always do, and three minutes later you end up in that situation. So this particular video, uh, Bendix ISP, is our electronic stability program for IC bus, is going to show you the skid pad that I referenced. So you'll be able to see with stability control and without stability control what the difference is between the two. And they're going to show that twice, and then there's a lot of filler stuff kind of in the middle. But I'll let you guys see that and look at the comparison there. Okay, so you get the idea. Again, stability system helps mitigate rollovers, loss of control, provides stability on, on both wet and dry roads. And really, again, it's the driver's intention versus what's actually happening, and it can selectively apply the brakes. So there's a different valve underneath now at each wheel. So it's an ABS modulator, but it basically it's, it's different than what you've had before and that this one can release on its own or not. And so there's obviously electronics that go into it that's telling it to do that. Any questions on the stability control part? For your guys' sake, uh, in the shop, what you're going to see is uh, if you do a front end alignment, let's say, you know, if you take the steering wheel off to reposition it because they tend to get a little out of whack after a while or sometimes from, from new, if you do a front end alignment, go into Bendix ACOM, the free software, and reset your steering angle sensor to zero once you're done with your job. So in other words, make sure the wheels are straight. It'll, it'll give you the whole breakdown, make sure the wheels are straight go in, hit reset, and it resets it back to zero so that the bus knows you know, what zero degrees is. You don't want your wheels straight and it thinking that they're at a 28 degree angle, let's say, because that could cause some problems. And that's really it as far as maintenance goes. So how you use it, you don't use it. Again, that goes back to my point of you have drivers that are well trained and they understand safe driving practices. That's how you use it. You drive normally, you drive safely, and you shouldn't really, in theory, even know that it's there. Um, Drivers need to be versed in both vehicle types though. So you've got new buses this year that have it, uh, but you've got old buses around for however many years now. They might be a year old, but they're gonna be around for the next nine or 10 years, let's say. And that new bus driver may go into a spare for a day or whatever, and it may perform differently. So they have to expect that. You know, If you normally take a turn in your bus and it doesn't fishtail, all of a sudden you get in the spare, you take the turn and it fishtails, it might catch them off guard. 
So it's important while we're in this transition phase that they understand the difference between the two and that they need to know how to drive the vehicle either way. They're still in control is the ultimate uh, kind of end to it. So this part is more uh, to kind of build you up and help you understand why we have the collision mitigation part of it. So I ask some questions in here, and keep in mind this is really formatted for a rather large group, but we'll make it work. So what do you guys think the leading cause of vehicle accidents is? What's your thought on that? Any thoughts? Texting. Texting, which would be distraction. Any other thoughts? Drinking and driving. That's bad, but yes, <laughs> probably the second leading. Uh, distracted driving is, so I guess you could technically lump that in there, but uh, distracted driving is the leading cause of vehicle accidents statistically. And again, you think about when you go down the road, how many people are on their phone? And it's, it's constantly, it's this, then you get the brave guy that's up here like this, it doesn't care. Uh, you see that all the time. And what I often think about is the fact that you're looking, you're in your bus, let's say, and you come up to, you're next to a car going down the road, you look down, they're on their phone, and you're thinking to yourself, you know, get off your phone, and now you're distracted by the distracted person. So they've pulled you into their mess by just pulling your eyes off the road. You know, you think about how far you travel in three seconds. You're looking at that person for three seconds who's texting, and now you're just as distracted. So are all accidents preventable, aside from, let's say, act of God or animal, do you think? Preventable? OK, I think it's, it's debatable. My, my take on it is if a tree falls on your car going down the road, you really couldn't do anything about that. And actually, just down the street from my house, that happened. The tree, it, I mean, it, it landed on the hood. It couldn't have happened at a better time, I guess. Um, but think about you get rear-ended. Shouldn't have happened. Somebody was following too closely. Maybe you stopped too quickly. If there's two people involved, somebody did something wrong, period. You know, people test the light. They see yellow, and they speed up. Um, they see the light changing for the, uh, you know, the cross traffic. And what do they do? They start to roll rather than waiting till their light turns green and scanning the intersection. Somebody's always at fault, in my opinion. If you back into a building, it's your fault. Back into another car, it's preventable. Most accidents, I think, are preventable. Do you think that driving a school bus is distracting, just driving the bus? I disagree, but don't. Driving the bus is the easy part. It's once you put the kids behind you that it gets to be a little more uh, difficult. You've got conversations going on. You've got questions in your ear, especially if you guys are filling in for somebody, which probably happens on the regular. You've got a lot of confusing things going on. You've got a radio. You've got a route sheet, an area you don't know. You know kids behind you asking questions, yelling about why you're going this way or that way. It can be very distracting. Do you think a driver can be too confident in what they do? I would agree with that, and I, but I think there's a little bit of a nuance there in that it's are they overconfident or are they confident? I think confidence is being able to say that I can't do something, you know, pulling up with your signal on, looking down that side street and going, there's no way I'm going to fit. Maybe there's a garbage truck and a landscaping trailer, you know, especially in the you know, late summer months. That confidence is saying, there's no way. Overconfidence is saying, sure. And they go through and they tear a luggage bin off the side of the bus or you know, rip a stop sign off or something like that. To me, that's overconfident. Or the person that pulls into the bus loop so fast that their bus rocks side to side for about 30 seconds until it settles, that's the overconfident person. You know, They're just waiting for something to happen because they've done it well every other time, so why would this time be any different until it is different? So this statistic is interesting. NTSB put this out. So at any given moment last year, uh, one in every 100 car drivers was texting, emailing, or surfing the web. I think, truthfully, that number is a lot higher than that. You go down the road, I think it's probably about 80 or 90 out of 100 people are on their phone. And it's not necessarily the 16-year-old. I've seen all ages, as you have, from 16 to you know 70-something on the phone texting or reading a newspaper or doing whatever. You know, they're just not focused on what they should be. Worse yet is that most people don't think that it's dangerous when they do it. You know, well, I, I, can, I can multitask. It's fine. Second you look down at the phone, what happens? They start drifting. You know, they can't multitask. Even if they think they can, they can. So this collision in uh, St. James, Missouri is a prime example of where this technology can be useful. So what happened was a pickup truck driver who is here was texting, not paying any attention, 
the tractor here slowed down for a work zone and the pickup truck driver of course was not paying attention moving at a high rate of speed staring down and again you think about how far do you travel in five seconds quite far he rear-ended the truck the first school bus driver rear-ended him rolled him up and ended up in the position they're in and then the second school bus rear-ended the first school bus and killed the girl in the back seat so the girl in the back seat died as did the driver of the pickup truck What's interesting is when you read the report, it really kind of ties into why this technology matters. And it's again that the first pickup truck driver was distracted. Pickup truck driver was distracted due to text messaging. Again, this is the NTSB report, you can find it online. Second collision, the first school bus driver had inattention to the forward roadway. So they probably thought they were doing everything right. And what you read is that there was a motor coach on the shoulder of the road. So if you actually look at the, the whole aerial shot of the collision, they were going up a hill and they had crested the hill and so what I'm wondering and the speculation is maybe the driver was in the right lane they came up the hill and saw the, the coach on the shoulder put their left signal on to move over maybe you know and how willing are people to let you move over they don't want to give your signal on you do one of these things you're kind of watching they don't want to let you in um, who knows maybe the, the bus had hazard lights on maybe somebody was in the engine bay you don't know what it was point is they were focused on that Suddenly the car in front of them, the truck is stopped and they went right into it. Second school bus driver, the final collision, the driver did not maintain the minimum recommended following distance. It's pretty obvious when you look at it. What's interesting is the media was very quick to latch onto this 19 year old kid that was texting and how he caused this accident. I think that everybody involved, except for the tractor driver, was just as guilty. You know, the first school bus driver, um, maybe didn't have proper following distance. Second school bus driver definitely didn't have proper following distance. Sometimes think about when you're going down the road and you're behind somebody and they suddenly slam on their brakes and they're stopping quick. What do you have to do? You gotta do the same thing. You're relying on them to be following at a safe distance but what you may find is that they weren't following at a safe distance so now they're slamming on their brakes and now you're having to slam on your brakes and it's this kind of chain reaction of, of people stopping. So it may have been something like that. They were focused on the pickup truck not the slowed traffic ahead, he stopped quicker than they were prepared to deal with, and that's what happened. The last line of the report is interesting in that it says contributing to the severity of the accident was the lack of a forward collision warning system on the two buses. So back in 2010, they were talking about the benefits of having collision mitigation systems on school buses, and we only recently finally adopted that technology. So up to you, and I'm, I'm focusing on texting, and you're probably thinking that's a little strange because it's not our big problem, but I'm gonna kind of break through and, and show you why I'm stuck on texting in particular. So it involves all three types of distractions, and that's visual, manual, and cognitive. You know, when you're, you're looking at your phone, you're holding it, and you're thinking about what you're gonna say. When you drive a route with students, though, you have a lot of the same thing when you really break it down. So when you have a route sheet, how is that not visual, manual, and cognitive distraction? You're reading it, you're holding it, and you're thinking about it. It's, okay, turn right on, you know, 3rd Street. Okay, now you're looking, you're looking, you're looking. What are you doing? You're thinking about everything but what's going on around you. You're looking for that sign because you don't want to miss it. So you've got the route sheet. Even if you've got tablets, districts that use a tablet now, it might say audibly, turn right on 3rd Street. Okay, now you're thinking about it. You may look at it. Tablets are now allowed to be illuminated, so you've got distraction that way too. Pupil mirror, the number seven overhead mirror, that's very much visual and it's cognitive, I think. You've got kids in the back seat that you know aren't supposed to be sitting together, and what are you doing? You look up, so you're paying attention to that, and what are you doing? You're thinking about what those kids are doing and why they're together. You don't want to hear you know, the complaints later on that they were sitting together when they shouldn't have been, so you ask them to move. You're thinking about other things. Or, my favorite as the subdriver is when dispatch calls and says, based to so-and-so, did you drop Lily off yet? Like, I don't know who Lily is because I'm the sub driver. I have no idea. So now what do you do? You pick up your radio or your, your PA mic. You're looking. You're asking questions. You're distracted. With that, I say warning light activation, but it could be anything. It could be turning heaters on and off, warning lights, um, adjusting the radio, anything really, doing the wipers. Two-way radio itself is very distracting. That is manual in some cases, can be visual. You've got radios now that display the bus number of who's talking in a lot of cases. And then you've got the cognitive, again, going back to based so-and-so, did you pick up Lily? 
I don't know who Lily is. So now you're thinking about it. Or have you been to such and such street? Or how long is it going to be until you get to X and you're the sub and you have no idea how long it's going to be? Now you're thinking. The route hypnosis thing. How many times have you gotten back here and have no recollection of the last 10 minutes at all? I'm pretty guilty of that. You know, I go, you go to take the same route day after day after day. You get in this autopilot mode and you park and you don't remember the last 10 minutes. You don't remember stopping at the stop sign, stopping at the light, whatever, and it makes you wonder what you missed. That is completely a cognitive thing. Of course, after the run, you know, this time of year it's still a little hot. You just want to be done. So you're thinking about what you're going to do later. And then, of course, the students very much visual, cognitive, hopefully not manual in most cases. So I equate all of these to being just as distracting as texting and driving. So that's why I kind of focused on texting, because you've got those three types of distractions, and each one of these kind of fits into the same category. So how is what we do any different than somebody that's texting going down the road? So why we need it, and again, it's, it's really to make transportation safer and uh, to act as a backup when things go wrong. So you've got a lot going on behind you, in front of you. You're driving for your, not only yourself, but other people when you think about it. You're, you're compensating for other people's lack of knowledge. It's good to have a backup there when maybe your compensation was not adequate. So I will go through all of the features and what it does and how it works. And this would be kind of the more interesting part probably for you. Uh, feel free to ask questions about things. What we've found so far is uh, nothing, no mechanical or electronic issues related to the system in any complaint that we get or any commentary that we've received. What we've found, as mentioned, is pretty much it's driver error in 99% in of cases. Uh, we did have one instance where there was a, a bad brake switch in the bus, and that caused confusion and, and some trouble, um, but not related to the collision mitigation system at all. So again, feel free to stop me. So you guys are running Wingman Fusion, which is the top of the line version of the system. A few things that you've noticed is you've got a radar unit in the front bumper. You've got a camera mounted into the windshield, and then you've got a driver interface unit on the right side of your dashboard. Some of the things that people should be able to do when they drive these buses is not only locate those, but understand what they're for and what they do. Not saying that they have to be an expert, but they should at least have a general understanding of what those things are. With that, understanding the precautions that are coming in the, you know, we're going to see snowflakes in probably a month, and so we have to be ready to deal with that, unfortunately. And again, you're running buses with and without. So people should be able to understand that there are differences between the two systems. So we're going to focus on Fusion. Again, you've got those three particular units. You've got other districts locally. They're running the Wingman Advanced system. So you may be having a conversation at a meeting, and they're going to say, well, it doesn't do that. And you're going to say, well, yeah, it does. And maybe that's true. Neither one of you might be wrong. It's that their system might do something a little bit different than what your system does. So just understand there is a difference between the two. So the radar unit, as you know, is mounted front and center in the bumper, and that is sending out a signal about 500 feet ahead, and it's looking for feedback from a large metallic object. So it's no good for cardboard boxes or pedestrians, but primarily you know, motorcycles, trucks, buses, things like that. Driver interface unit, the DIU, primarily a driver information center. There's a couple things you can do with it. There's volume, there's display settings as far as brightness goes. You can change the units in there from seconds to feet. Uh, I don't really know how useful it is to understand how many feet you are from something in most cases. So they're, they're set to seconds for following distance. Um, if you've driven these buses, you kind of understand what that's displaying, but I'll go through it. And then, of course, the fusion camera mounted to the windshield there. Of course, all of these, as you know, are DOT approved. Um, and the camera is considered a piece of safety technology, and that's why it's allowed to be mounted where it is, and that's different than a forward-facing camera that might be tied to your interior camera system. So all the features you get, I'm going to list them for you, and then I'll kind of go through them. And again, you've got experience, which helps, but uh, you've got electronic stability control as a standard on everything. You've got now adaptive cruise control, which you referenced earlier. You've got following distance alerts, impact alerts, collision mitigation, meaning, meaning automatic braking. You've got stationary object alerts, uh, stationary vehicle braking, and then uh, overspeed alert in action and lane departure warnings. So some of these other things like alert prioritization, active and passive assistance aren't necessarily something that you need to know going down the road, but they are system features. So active means that the system can apply the brakes if it needs to and take action. And we're the only bus right now on the market that can actually do that. Other buses on the market are purely a passive and that's only audible and visual, that's it. 
So we've got the advantage of being able to do both. So our bosses can actually apply the brakes in a, in a collision mitigation situation. So you think about uh, adaptive cruise control and what's going to happen is the, the way it's supposed to work is you set your cruise control as always. You know, if you're on 90, you set it to 55. What's going to happen is it's going to maintain your speed of 55 just like cruise control always would. If a car gets in front of you, say they slow down, what will happen is the radar is sending out a signal and it's going to say that gap is closing, that car is going, let's say 50, we need to maintain that gap. So what's going to happen is the bus is going to de-throttle itself to maintain about a three and a half second gap between you and the forward moving vehicle. Should they get back up to speed, 55, let's say, your bus is also going to throttle back up to 55, and at that point, that's it. It's not going to do anything additional. If they get up to 60, your bus will not exceed 55 because that's your set speed. Just like any cruise control that you've ever, ever used, what your set speed is is the most that it will ever do. Okay, if you hit your brakes, of course, it deactivates it like any other vehicle would. The idea is just to maintain that safe gap. So you go back to that St. James accident, and if those buses had adaptive cruise control, the outcome maybe would have been a little bit different. So maybe in town you don't use it because there's a lot going on and you really don't use cruise control when you're in a busy area, but on the throughway it can be helpful and kind of take some of the stress off of maintaining a safe distance. You can override it, you can accelerate and add more speed, but now what happens is you're closing a gap that shouldn't be closed. You're taking away this base cushion and it's going to alert you with a following distance alert to say that you're getting too close to the forward vehicle. So you've got three levels of that. You've got first, second, and third, so basically bad, worst, the worst, kind of the best way to put it, but you understand what I mean. You've got, and, it, and that varies too, so at 30, safe following distance is different than at 50, and it knows that. So for example, you're coming up on a car that's going slower than you are, maybe you're going 45 and they're going 40. You're getting closer and closer and you're in control of the pedal, you're driving normally. What's going to happen is the radar is sending out that signal about 500 feet ahead and it's saying that car is going 40, you're going 45, and you're going to see your following distance in seconds on the display on the dash. And it's going to continue to, to decrease and you're going to see their speed on there as well. They show you their speed so that you can match yours to theirs and maintain a you know, safe, reasonable distance. If you continue to kind of override that and continue to get closer and closer, and don't respond, what's going to happen is you're going to get a first level following distance alert. And it's a single beep to indicate that you're getting too close and you're going to see the little yellow light come on. It might be very common as you're getting used to these to hear that on the regular. You're going to hear this constant beeping when you're going down the road and it's going to be very frustrating and it, it's going to be irritating you're not going to want to deal with it. But the reality is if it's sounding an alarm, something is not right. So when I first started driving our bus with it, now over a year ago, a year and a half ago, uh, I found all the time that I was getting close following distance alerts. And I immediately thought that I didn't like the system. I thought, I don't want anything to do with this. It's irritating. I don't want to, I don't want to deal with it. Uh, what happens is you learn that you're doing something wrong, and it's perception. So my perception of safe maybe is different than your perception of safe. And uh, the example I use is the counting seconds. You know, the car passes the cone and you start counting 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000. I might count faster than you count. We both say it's four seconds, but I counted faster, so it's a different four seconds, if you know what I mean. So what I found is I had to modify my habits and adjust accordingly. And I can now drive the bus for weeks and never hear a sound because I've learned what safe visually looks like. And so you're going to get a lot of that kind of growing pain stuff as you start with this. Drivers are going to come back and they're probably going to be a little flustered. They're not going to like it. But that means that they have to adjust their habits and that's the only way that they're going to silence it, truthfully. There's a second level alert, meaning you're getting closer still. And then, of course, a third level, closest. It takes a lot of effort to get to a third level alert. Even second level, you really have to be playing a dangerous game to get to that point. It, at, say at 45 miles an hour, you're close enough where you can't see the bumper of the vehicle in front of you. You're, you're very close. So it gives you ample opportunity to correct yourself and take action. If you choose not to, though, it can take over. So you know this display at this point. There's your following distance in seconds, your alert with the flashing lights, and then you get an audible with it as well. So impact alert is kind of your last call. So you've gone through first, second, and third level alerts. You've got about a half second now before the bus decides that it's going to apply the brakes for you, period. You're not doing anything. 
that vehicle is moving slower, that gap is continuing to close and close and close, driver doesn't respond, what happens is the brakes apply themselves and basically create a gap. As you know, it's not a graceful or gentle stop at all. It's very much like taking your foot and mashing it on the brake pedal. That's really what it is. And the brake lights will come on, so people behind you know what's going on. But uh, either way, it's a very abrupt stop. And the idea is to prevent contact. So it may be, depending on how slow that vehicle's going, it may be a quick jab of the brakes where it says, OK, we need you know one second application. It may be a three or four second application, depending on the situation. What you could see is, uh, let's say you come up on somebody extremely fast. You know, they're going 30, you're going 50, and you're coming up on them. What can happen is it might skip the first level alert altogether and go right to second or third level because you're coming in really hot. You know, there's no time to warn you otherwise. So again, it's, it's a, a habit thing. You have to be aware of um, the surroundings. So even in a slow moving traffic situation, let's say in the school loading zone in the morning where there's cars and buses, and the driver's moving slow. If they're accustomed to stopping about half a car's length from the vehicle in front of them, let's say, the system isn't going to like that. Because what's going to happen is that driver is slowing down, right? They're slowing and they're getting closer and closer and closer. And they're ultimately getting too close to that vehicle ahead of them. So even when you're stopped, you've got to maintain that space cushion that we train people to maintain anyway. So you may have a little bit of a learning curve with that. And we've seen that in one, one instance already where driver was going you know, about 10 miles an hour in a school zone. The car was in front of him, and he was getting closer and closer because he was going to stop too close, in other words. So the system quick hit the brakes and said, you know, you're getting too close. So the collision mitigation part, again, for a forward moving or a stationary vehicle in the case of fusion. With the lesser system, it's not going to stop you for a stopped car. Your system will. So whether the car is stopped or rolling slower, if that bus is closing the gap too quickly and the driver's not doing anything, the system is going to respond accordingly and apply the brakes. So if the driver is using the exhaust brake and the bus is slowing down, that doesn't matter. What happens is the radar is simply saying how much time until we hit. That's all it wants to know is how much time to impact. It doesn't matter how much you're braking or how much you're slowing, that gap needs to be closing fast enough for that system to recognize that the driver's doing what they're supposed to. So. Um, again, the driver will be given notice. It's not just going to happen. Something's wrong if it is happening, you know, with, with the driver's habit most likely. Any questions on that part of it? Hopefully it's not a too common occurrence, but uh, we've had a couple instances where people have had it happen. And again, it's, it's primarily a learning curve. You're just trying to figure things out. So the stationary object alert, so with this system, if there is a vehicle in your lane of travel that's stopped, you're going to be alerted that it's there about three seconds ahead of time. Say, hey, there's something there. That's your chance to react to it. Should you not react to it, that's when you're going to get your impact alert followed by collision mitigation braking if you didn't respond. So there's plenty of, of forewarning again. So anybody that comes in and says, it just stopped, I have, I have a hard time believing that. Again, collision mitigation, wingman advanced will not apply the brake for parked vehicle, wingman fusion will, so your system can do it for any vehicle on the road. Lane departure alerts. So the camera and the windshield reads the lines on the road, and above 37 miles per hour, it can notify you if you've left your lane of travel. So if you're out there trying it when the buses first come in and you're going 15, 20 over the lines, it's not going to do a thing. It's once you hit 37, you begin to accelerate at a high rate of speed. You know, you're going to hear a rumble strip sound come from the bulkhead speakers, depending on the side, to indicate that you've left your lane of travel. So some vehicles are very sensitive to that. You know, the second you touch the line, it goes off. This gives you a little more leeway, which is important as we're a wide vehicle. So you've got to be about 6 to 12 inches over the lane or out of your lane before it will actually notify you that, that you've left your lane. It's a loud sound. If you've experienced it unexpectedly, it will startle you and definitely bring you <coughs> excuse me, back to focus. Um, situations where a uh, driver is signaling properly, it's not going to do anything. So if you've got somebody that lazily goes around a mail truck or a garbage truck and they cross the line and cross back in without signaling in any way, they're going to hear the sound on the way out. And they're going to hear it probably more than once. And that indicates that you've left your lane and you shouldn't have. If you use your turn signal or you use your hazards, the system says, okay, this is an intentional maneuver. It's not going to do anything. So 
in some situations you might want a more uh, a long-term disable so construction zones for example uh, there's road markings kind of everywhere you know i see baldwinsville buses on 90 all the time when i'm coming this way and 90 is a notoriously long-term construction zone so you've got temporary striping old striping and the bus is kind of moving all over the place you may get a false alert to say you've left your lane when in reality you haven't so on your panel on the left side there's a switch that says ldw disable and that's your 15 minute momentary cancel so you can continue to do what you have to do um, and not have any false alerts so again passing tractors or bicyclists signaling hazards will silence the system again you've got the ldw disable there hit that and you get a 15 minute window where you can do what you have to do what you'll see in the winter sometimes is especially if there are fresh snow the roads are covered in white and you might be one of the first vehicles down the road that day or maybe one of the first few and so there's black lines on the pavement where the tires are typically traveling. What happens sometimes is the camera says, I see a line, and you may get an alert to say that you've left your lane, and reality is you haven't. You're driving where you're supposed to, but you've got white, black, white, black, you know, and so on. So it's seeing that. That's a moment or a situation where you want to use that momentary cancel, and that's the LDW disable. Just hit it once, and for 15 minutes, you're good, and usually by then, you're off that road. I've experienced that maybe once or twice through an entire winter, you know, on, on side roads and things like that, but it's pretty uncommon. If you want to reactivate it, you just hit it again. So on your display on the right side, when you hit it, you're actually going to see a little X come up that shows that it's canceled. And then, of course, as you go down the road, you'll notice that that'll actually change. So if there's no yellow line on your left, it goes away on the display. So it's always reading uh, the road accurately. So then you've got overspeed alert in action. And this is the one that I think uh, people, if Following distance alerts are probably the first thing that people discover they don't like. And this is probably the second thing that people discover that they don't like, and that's the overspeed alert in action. So that camera actually reads the sign as it's posted. It's not relying on a GPS signal. That's important because oftentimes we have work zones where the speed has been changed and it doesn't know that. Or if you ever have a, like an older GPS, it'll say, you know, speed limit 55 and then you'll pass a sign that says 30 and it takes it a minute to catch up to realize that you're now in the 30. This system reads the sign that's there. So it's, it's got to be a standard black and white sign and what it'll do is read it and it's doing a quick reference check. So if the driver is within four miles per hour of that posted speed, it's happy. So we'll say it's 30 and they're going 34 when they pass the sign. The display is going to show speed limit 30. If they're going 34, it's not going to do anything. It's fine. There's a little bit of a window there. As soon as they hit 35 plus, now you're going to get an audible alert that indicates, hey, you're, you're going too fast. And that's it, just an audible. Second level, what happens is if you're now 10 plus, say it's posted 30 and you're hitting 40, now you get a, an audible alert and a one second dethrottle. It's not a braking application, it's a dethrottle. So you'll feel the throttle actually cut out for a minute, you'll feel the engine lose power. And that's just kind of a, hey, you know, pay attention, you're going too quick. If you are in cruise control, these are completely unrelated, completely not tied together in the least. I've had the question, if it reads a sign, is it going to slow me down because it knows that the new speed is what? No, it's not going to. It's only reading and doing a reference check to figure out what you're doing. It's not tied to anything else. So cannot apply the vehicle brakes. It's only going to dethrottle and do a quick check. And it's not going to remember anything either. So once that sign is read and it goes away, that's it. It doesn't remember the speed that it last saw because you run into issues where you've turned onto a county road where there is no posted speed. You go from a 30 to a guess, you know, or it goes from 30 to 55 and the sign is leaned over. We don't want it remembering things. So best way to deal with this is to make sure that by the time you get to that speed sign, you're going the proper speed. And that's often what happens is you go from a 55, let's say there's a 30 mile per hour speed zone, you go from 55 down to 30, how often are you truly hitting 30 by the time you get to that sign? Most people coast into it and they finally hit 30 just in time to start going back 55 again. This can't, you're, you're, not gonna, you're gonna be able to do it, but you're gonna hear about it is what's gonna happen. So you've gotta make sure that you are paying attention to posted speed on the road. What you may have found already, and it's, it's a, kind of an odd thing that I don't know how to explain, is some signs it just flat out won't read. There's no particular rhyme or reason to it. It looks normal, it's a black and white sign, but for some reason, it doesn't detect it at all. It's another reason why we don't want it to remember certain things. Um, school zone signs, most of the time it's not gonna read those unless it's in the standard format. 
that's what it has to be. So again, it's got to be this typical black and white, a ramp sign, it's not going to read. Some of these oddball school zone signs, most of the time, no, it has to be in this particular format. Nice thing is in construction zones, uh, even though the work zone, it might be 11 o'clock at night and it's a ghost town, if it's posted 55, we know that the work zone is 55, whether there's people in it or not, unless it specifically states otherwise. So now we have the advantage of making sure that our driver is going 55 when they enter a work zone, because oftentimes it's tempting to keep up with traffic, which is usually going too fast. So the faults, a couple things could happen. So a lot of the lights are the same. You've got your typical ABS light, traction control light, which is obviously the TC, and the upside down triangle that they use for multiple things to confuse people. So what can happen, like anything, is if there's a fault in the ABS system, obviously let's say there's an ABS sensor that's no good on the front left wheel. The system, the stability control, is relying on ABS to function. So what's going to happen is it's going to completely disable that system because it can't function properly. So like anything, you're going to see probably the upside down triangle and the ABS light come on. And you may, in this case, see a traction control light come on because now that system is tied into it. So it's going to say, you know, system fault. And oftentimes the little orange display that gives you a readout of what the problem is, you know, is not overly descriptive. So it might say uh, radar fault, system fault, because it can't differentiate between something wrong with the radar or something wrong with ABS, whatever it might be. So you might see those lights come on, but those are something you're familiar with, and you just handle that how you would normally handle that uh, within your operation. Again, the driver should understand it's still operable and safe. You know, so many times the light comes on and panic mode ensues, and it's what do I do, and how do I do, and do I need a spare, and you know, is this safe? It's still safe. You can drive the bus. It's just like an older vehicle without ABS. Not ideal. Handle it soon, but you can still operate. You know. Drivers should know though, that some things might be limited. So if you don't have electronic stability control, you know, you are losing features and they need to understand that. So now they may fishtail around that corner. They need to understand these things. So at some point, and you're going to be probably experiencing this soon with the weather, is uh, blocked radar or blocked camera fault. So what happens is typically snowy weather, you're fine. It's when you get that really wet, sticky stuff that just kind of clings to the front of everything in sheets, that's where you may have an issue, I don't want to call it an issue, uh, an instance of blocked radar. So last winter, I think I had two instances again in the whole winter of where I actually had that happen. And I was glad that it did because I wanted to see it. Um, what will happen is you're going to hear the Bendix unit on the right side of the dash make a funny tone. It almost sounds like an old dial tone. And uh, it will light up and say, you know, system fault something like that. It'll give you like an SPN, FMI, blah, 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 number that means nothing. And then you're going to see, of course, the upside down triangle, come on, ABS light, you know, different things to, to notify the driver that something has gone wrong. Once that does that, this is what the, the screen is going to change to. So it's going to say wingman blocked, in this case, camera OK. And that means that the radar unit is completely blocked and it cannot send out a signal. So the camera, as you know, is in the wiper path. So the likelihood of the camera becoming blocked is pretty slim. Even with um, a dirty windshield, you know, in the winter when we get all that salt and the wipers aren't adequately keeping it clean, it reads just fine. I was actually going to Plattsburgh uh, a couple months ago and left, where was I coming? Albany, going up to Plattsburgh, and started to rain, turned the wipers on. Wipers went up and this blade went flying. And it was, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So and I'm on 87 in the middle of no man's land going to Plattsburgh. And so it was, it was raining hard enough that people were moving pretty slow. And uh, the camera had no issues at any point seeing through the rain, fortunately, uh, radar either. But what will happen is you will get a blocked fault from time to time. Nice thing is this is completely repairable by the driver. I don't mean repair in the sense of used tools, but meaning they can take care of it themselves without having to write it up, which is a nice uh, bonus. So what they need to do is when they have an opportunity, shut the bus off, brush the front of the radar off, and turn the bus back on, and that's it. That's all you have to do is uh, clear the radar of what's blocking it. So what happens is when you turn the key on, typically you know the ABS system runs its self-check. This is now part of it. So it's going to run its self-check, and the radar unit is sending out a signal and saying, can I see here, yes, no, OK. So when you start the bus, you're actually going to see, and you probably notice this screen will say, wingman, OK camera okay and that indicates that they can see and hear and do what they have to do uh, to function. So 
brush it off, restart the bus, that's it. There's no need to pull over, there's no need to write it up unless it doesn't clear the issue, but uh, just keep it clean, that's it. So I will add, so we've seen one instance of a bad brake switch which led them to believe that it was a collision mitigation issue and it wasn't. Uh, the other was a brake was actually hanging up at one wheel on a bus and the driver thought that the system was holding the brakes for them. The reality is it's not going to do that. It was an issue with the, the brakes on that particular vehicle. Uh, so there's been a couple of oddities, but truth be told, we haven't had anything related specifically to collision mitigation issues, fortunately. So I won't go through this in great detail, but on our website, uh, leonardbus.com forward slash training, or go to the site, click training, you have all these documents there. So you've got a driver trainer document, supervisor driver tech, and then a fact sheet. And that is really tailored to each individual person. So bus drivers only need to know so much sometimes, and technicians only need to know so much, and supervisors only need to know so much. So we've kind of tailored it where it works for the person that's interacting with it. You know, the supervisor may use it and give it to the business manager to present at a board meeting or not. You know, we just want to make sure everybody has kind of resources to use and be able to answer different questions. This actually says advanced, that should say fusion, that's bad on my part, but we've got a training guide for the fusion system as well that runs through everything from how to identify the system, what to look for, why to look for it, where it is, what it does. And the part at the bottom here you can't read on this screen, but it gives you a system feature followed by what the driver action should be. So for example, the following distance alert begins sounding. The driver action is to increase your following distance. It's pretty simple. So we kind of give it and break it down into a simple format for everybody. Um, that's the website there. And uh, that's really it. 